we got a fun one for you this week, bitches. That's right. Are you ready to talk about making your dreams come true in Hollywood while looking like a model? Are you ready to talk about what it's like to have power and trauma? <laughs> when, do, when those things when combine, those combine, you become you successful. Star. That's right. Uh, media mogul, actor, writer, extraordinaire, Dwayne Perkins is on the show today. And it's a wild one, bitches. So yeah. enjoy. Get ready. M. Oh. M. Mom. When first choice is a big old bus, you turn around and boom, you end up with a sloppy second. Oh, diva. Our number is 213 hey. 536 yeah. 91 80 or email at sloppy seconds at gmail.com. Now on with this show. Oh, how you stop using the different people. <laughs> the words? I'm Meepa, and that's big different. I'm on my third Red Bull. It's crank, as they would say, crank city. I'm cranked. Sugar free. It's, um, did Christina Aguilera do red hair? No. But it is very much like when she did it in Blonde and Black for Dirty. Right, right, When right, she, right. in fact, was black. I feel like I tee you up for that joke every time. Do you remember that, though? Those were different times. Do you like comedy? Yes. Do you like social commentary? Yes. Do you like being pretty and looking like a model and being successful? Never happened. Well, me. get ready for all that. Please welcome our very special guest today, Dwayne, Dwayne Perkins! Ow, bow, 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 bow. Oh, my God. Thank you. That was a great intro. More people should say that. <laughs> the pretty part. The pretty and yes. successful. Thank you. And a model. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. How are you? I'm doing well. So nice to see you. Likewise, how are you two? You know. Good. Yeah, doing it. I'm not convinced. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. 100% honest with you, I like got home from New York at like 1.30 this morning. So I like mm. slept for like maybe 45 minutes and then I uh, got into drag for this. Okay. So baby, I'm cranked on the Red Bull. Oh, you just say third and I said, yikes, right. on the well, inside. You, that's why my stomach was growling. Oh, it's saying, it's help, like, help me. Help me, please, <laughs> don't kill me. There are people though in this world who really still don't truly know what water is. Oh yeah. And it's like, they'll just spend the day drinking Red Bulls. Yes, uh, I had a, my last like writer's room. Everybody drank coffee, and I didn't. So I was like, "Oh, I'll just like drink a Red Bull to like stay up." And by like the third or fourth day, I was feeling crazy. And they were like, "Yeah, you you've drank a Red Bull like every day." And I don't drink a lot of caffeine. Mm. And I was like, <laughs> "Now I get it." Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. yeah. And some people get addicted to it. Like I know that there's some people that like they just drink coffee three or four cups oh. every morning. And that's you. I'm a I'm a big coffee drinker. And then he'll drink enough water, but then in the afternoon, like two o'clock, you go in for more coffee. I do. And I now, you know, it's always the thing like my mom used to always say, like, Oh, I can't have chocolate after five PM. I'll be up all night. The caffeine. I am now of the age, an older age. Forty five. Thank you. Um but I'm now of the age that if I do drink coffee past 5 p.m., I will be up late. It's a new thing. We learn and grow and change every day. What is late? To what is me, late to you? Like, past midnight is late. I'm like, two, three. Whoa. Oh, you're a night What time are you Not waking up? Gasp. <laughs> we are early. We, I go to bed at 11.30. What oh. time are you? So you're going to bed at 2 or 3 in the morning. What time are you getting up to you begin your like day? Eight thirty nine. Okay, that's productive. Yeah, that's, that's like great. normal. Mm -hmm. You just like actively don't need as much sleep as most people. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it's the best, um, but that's what I'm working with. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great way to come to the uh -huh. table. Um, okay, so most of our listeners will probably know you from your movie, The Blackening. Oh, nice. Uh, which came out la last year. Yes, last yeah. summer. Um, I mean, this is a broad stroke question. Do it. But how was it for you to see an idea from its infancy all the way up to like the biggest version of itself? Like that movie came out of a sketch mm -hmm. that then sort of got developed into the movie and then the movie happened and was released in theaters. That's like the whole, that's like the success story. Yes. Was that fun? <laughs> <laughs> you always ask questions like that. You're always like, fun? how was that? How was that for you? <laughs> you know, it was very affirming uh, in the sense of I've always kind of moved in a, like, I think I'm great kind of vibe. But being like, I just don't think people know yet. Like, they just don't know what I'm capable of. 
So then to have something that like followed me in that way as my career was like growing, it was kind of like this constant reminder, be like, I knew I had something. Mm. Um, and so that was like a great confidence booster. Um, and then it brought a lot of good, like a lot of other opportunities spawned from it. So it just was kind of like the origin of my career, like in general. And I think it's beautiful that the origin of my career came from me at a time where um, there was nothing for me to create art, but for the sake of creating art. So it feels really like pure. Um, That's so I awesome. love it. It was such a good movie. Oh, yeah. My friend Sashir rented out a movie theater and like invited all of her friends to go watch it. And I was dying the whole time. So tell me, what Thank was the you. sketch? Like, how did you extend a sketch out from like a stage sketch to then Comedy Central, then to a full movie? Yes. Uh, I was working at um, at a comedy institution in Chicago. And they had like. Don't say their name. I will not. That's why I said okay. county institution. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I, we'll get to that. I kept it quite <laughs> general. <laughs> you won't get free promo from me. <laughs> um, uh, but we were doing an all black sketch show, uh, and it was like a big deal because you know they had a race problem, um, and so we needed like an opening sketch for mm-hmm. that particular show. And I remember I was on my couch, I was like a little high and I was watching horror movies and I was just like, oh, like that would be really cool to kind of parallel the experiences of like the black people at this institution to like horror and how we were all kind of like token off at one time. So then if we all come together, like if we were all in a horror movie, like if they had to pick like who's the blackest of the tokens, Mm -hmm. how would they do it? Mm -hmm. So that kind of parallel to black people's relationship in horror movies. And I was like, oh, that's a great idea that if we were all in a horror movie and the black person had to die first, then uh, how would they decide they'd have a competition? Or like, we'd have to like <laughs> talk about race I just keep in a way <laughs> where like, you're not necessarily saying like, I'm the blackest, but you're trying to speak to like the parts of you that are not seen as black to mm-hmm. save yourself. So that's like a backwards way into the commentary of talking about like what is blackness yeah so it was like very late i thought i was like so deep i was like oh this is so cool <laughs> and then um yeah and then that was put up in chicago that it moved to dc and like this bigger theatrical show and then um my improv group three pete had a web series deal with comedy central and that was a sketch that i submitted to be filmed so they picked that one first so we like filmed it they put it up and then it went viral. Mm-hmm. And then that's when Tracy Oliver saw it and was like, hey, this sh- should be a movie. And I was like, bet. <laughs> uh, okay. Because again, I response. was like, well, I never did a movie, but like, I feel like I, I can do it. Just be delusionally confident. You could do anything. Um, I'm jealous. And so then, yeah, then we um, wrote it. it. It was bought. It got into TIFF where it, premiered and then it was bought by Lionsgate Mm -hmm. and then it premiered in America at Tribeca and then it came out in the summer. It was truly crazy. It made money. It did. Oh yeah, it did make a ton of money. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Rich. (laughs) (laughs) Mm, Relatively. (laughs) Aside from yourself, was anyone from like the original sketch in Chicago involved all the way up to the movie? Like any of the actors, or like, did anyone sort of nope. oh, glom on? Just oh. me. Just did you get any emails about that? <laughs> no. Oh, Next. I originated the role. <laughs> no. Um, I think that like three Pete, like they're still my closest friends mm-hmm. right now, and th- th- the purpose of community is like knowing that it's like us versus them, and not mm-hmm. them versus us. So even throughout this process. <clears throat> When, when we first got it, they were like, oh, yeah, like, you wrote the sketch. Like, we were actors, and, like, we're your friend. Like, absolutely, go do this opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, and they know that, like, I didn't have any power. Like, they know how the yeah. system works. So it would be kind of, to be frank, dumb to have any feelings, knowing that, like, I was just, like, pulled up by some people. <laughs> just being like, hey, come do this thing. <laughs> So yeah, there was there's been nothing but support, and they know that like, if I could, they would like yeah right they they know, 
my people are always at the front of the line. Love that. Uh, I'm a very much open the door, leave it open. Please come. I don't want to be by myself. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. One thing I loved in the movie also is like, you know, I don't watch a lot of horror movies, so I'm, I'm no expert on the genre. But anytime I find a movie that I deem not too scary and that I can watch on a Saturday morning at mm-hmm. 10 a.m. while the sun is shining bright, um, I'm always sort of amazed at the like scenes in between the murders when people are like running from stuff or doing stuff and then choose to hash out their interpersonal uh, dynamic. And I, I always just think to myself, I'm like, just keep running. Like you, you'll deal with that later. And what I loved is that you elevated that in the movie. And that was actually like the majority of the movie was like hashing through like all of the, like the friend group drama and that, you know, made it, just so much more layered and fun to watch. Thank you. Um, I really am like obsessed with like horror movies and movies in general. I'm just like a really big nerd. So it was very fun to like try to make it as like smart as possible, mm. but also like imbuing as much as I could. There's so many references. There's so many things that I'm like directly making fun of. There's just like a lot that we put in it. And it's always nice to hear like different people's like what they got from it because like that's the f- like you're the first person to like point that out specifically. And I'm like, thank ooh, you. Ooh. What's yeah, your favorite horror here? movie? Yeah, um, it kind of ranges. Uh, like Candyman is like a very special movie to me because it was like mm. the first horror movie that I felt felt real because it was uh, filmed where my cousins lived and me mm. being like, oh, I have family in Cabrini Green. That's where Candyman is. Like it was mm-hmm. just like my child brain could not separate that. Like this is not real. How right. is right there? Uh, so that is like um, a very special horror movie that like just like stuck with me for a long time. But I really love The Bride of Chucky. Mm. That, that was really, really camp. Like yeah. yeah, like as a kid, like and me kind of forming my like point of view, like the horror comedy aspect of that. That was like an awakening for me because I remember the poster was like a parody of like the screen poster. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. And then to see that movie, we're like, we're, we know the bad person is like Chucky, but we're still like rooting for him because he's like the protagonist. Mm-hmm. And to like see kind of that shift in that series, I thought was just like really like moving the genre. And like that's what I think like really made Chucky like an icon, like by himself and not just like a horror figure. And they just keep making more and more cookies <laughs> mm-hmm. and a TV show. And I watched the series. I'm, it's pretty good. It's, I, I know. I, it's really I good. I enjoy it. Um, would you ever make like a sequel to your story? I know that there's like the huge twist at the end and we all know who the killer is, but like, would you do a second one? Would they go on vacation again? I would. Ooh. Yes. There was actually an announcement not too long ago that there's talks of such oh, a thing. Ooh. An announcement not oh. too long ago. Not too long ago. Mm-hmm. Well, listen, the strike's over now, so. Mm, everyone's back in those writers' room, mm-hmm. chugging coffee and typing away. They said, hurry the f*** up. <laughs> <laughs> they said, ah, things. <laughs> we things and it did well. Um, let's take a quick break, but we will be right back, and we're going to talk about writers' rooms. The new Stars series, Mary and George, starring Julianne Moore and Nicholas Galitzine, tells a story almost too outrageous to be true. But shockingly, it is. With next to nothing to her name and looking to elevate her social standing, Mary Villiers sets her handsome and charming son, George, on the path to seduce King James I and become his all-powerful lover. You've never seen a mother and son duo like this before. This show is full of wit, scandal, action, and did I mention Julianne Moore? Okay, something this audacious and sexy is as genre bending as it gets and you won't be able to look away. Watch the season premiere of Mary and George now, only on Stars and the Stars app. Eat stress-free this spring with Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals. Every fresh, never-frozen meal is chef-crafted, dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes. Choose from a weekly menu of 35 options, including categories like calorie-smart, keto, protein-plus, vegan, or veggie. 
Also, discover more than 60 add-ons every week, like breakfast, on-the-go lunch, snacks, and beverages to help you stay fueled and feel good all day long. So what are you waiting for? Get started today and fuel up for your springtime goals. I was so thrilled when Factor sent us meals to try out. I am normally very skeptical of prepackaged meals, um, especially ones you heat in the microwave. But I got to tell you, they have changed the game. I mean, this is fresh food because it is not frozen. The flavor is outstanding. These are like well put together meals and the protein, the chicken cutlet, I was convinced it was not going to be enough. That is a hearty, thick slice of chicken breast. Like there is plenty of food in each factor meal. And I think this is like an absolute awesome way if you're looking to make a shift or if you're just looking for some ease in how you prepare your food or how you have lunch on the go, Factor's got it covered. Get chef prepared meals on the table in two minutes with Factor's ready to eat meals so you can get back to doing what you love this spring or just get back to working all the time because that's what I do. Factor meals eliminate the hassle of prepping, cooking, or cleaning up. Simply heat and savor the good stuff. You can customize your weekly meals with flexibility to get as much or as little as you need delivered right to you. Plus, you can pause or reschedule deliveries to suit your lifestyle. And Factor is celebrating Earth Day all month long. So look out for their Earth Month Eats badge on the menu for the lowest carbon footprint meals. That's cool. Head to Factor Meals com slash sloppy seconds 50 and use code sloppy seconds 50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box. And that's the numbers five zero, not the word spelled out. That's code sloppy seconds 50 at factor com slash sloppy seconds 50 to get 50% off your box plus 20% off your next box while your subscription is active. And we're back! Has anyone ever scratched their nose in front of you like that? Yes. Oh, okay. I thought I, <laughs> I, I was yes. going to be the first. Have you had a something. human experience? <laughs> <laughs> Have you been in front of people? <laughs> Never, no. So you you have done a lot of work in Hollywood, in the entertainment world. Yes. And a lot of that is in writer's rooms. Mm-hmm. So you wrote, let's see if I have the list right. Saved by the Bell, a reboot. You oh, did work yes. on that. What a wonderful job. Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Yes. Uh, Michelle Wolf's show. That was my first job. That yes. was your first job. Mm-hmm. Uh, how long did that show, was that like two seasons, one season? Uh, I think it was one season, I okay. believe. And then Amber Ruffin show too. Yeah. And that comes with an Emmy nomination for it you did. as well. Uh, what is your experience in writers' rooms? How are they different? Like how like I assume everyone is totally different, but ultimately everyone you're trying to do the same thing, which is like write a TV show. Yes. Um, I mean, I would compare it to like any other job where kind of the vibe of the room is dictated by like a managerial figure. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it really does just, it's based on like who's leading the room and how they, and like what system they've created to try to get the most out of their writers. Um, and there's different methods. Some people are just like, oh, we're just like gonna be here for a long time. Cause like, it takes a long time to do it. I'm like, okay, well, in their <laughs> experience, <laughs> you would hate I would be like, you know, I got hard <laughs> out every day. So, like, in in their experience, like, that's what it was. Like, oh, they've come from rooms where, like, that is how that culture of that space was upheld. And then there's other rooms where I, and this is one of my favorite bosses. They were like, yeah, no, if we're not, if we have nothing to do, I will not be using your time. Like, we have. I have stuff to do, so I can only assume y'all have stuff to do. So unless we know every day what we are doing, I will not tell you to come. Oh wow! And I was like, ah, "What a good leader!" And <laughs> would you, what a good leader. <laughs> would you think that like they were equally as productive, or even more productive on the one where you weren't required to be there all the time? Uh, I think that it, it also that's objective, um, mm. and I think. And for me, in writers' rooms, I, I know what I'm being hired for. 
Mm. Like it's not necessarily my job to change an environment. Mm. It's for me to bring what I can bring and hope that like that is helpful to like whatever the creative is to the show. Um Wow. I think my phone and is it broken. happened in the last episode. Because I put it on silent then. <laughs> Can I ask you a question while he does this very embarrassing thing of yeah. turning his phone to silent? Were you responsible for making Jesse Spano do the strip tease scene and the reboot? Absolutely not. Who was responsible for that? No. They needed Emmy. <laughs> that was the best thing I'd ever I, seen. I think Saved by the Bell is still like so such a funny show. Yeah. And I think it's very underrated like the amount of jokes that were just in it the cast was very talented the writers were very talented um i think tracy is a fantastic showrunner like it was just a really cool experience and i got to be on it that was fun oh, as well yeah. did did you feel like you needed to go back and rewatch old episodes to, like research it or it was like a new vibe oh no like i already i was a fan of saved by the bell um but it it is a, a new thing yeah um and so, and I came in later, like as a consulting producer. So they wrote like a lot of it. And then I came mm-hmm. in and like went over and like added stuff, but it wasn't, I didn't have like a humongous hand in kind of what the season did. That I will give that all to the writers and Tracy. Um, but yeah, it was just like a very, um, like, cause when you, certain environments are created and then you kind of just come in them and you just kind of have to adjust. And that was one that was just like a very easy environment to come into, mm-hmm. give your best and then be like, wow, that was great. All right, bye. And, and I really do think like that's what the job should be. You just yeah. kind of come in, you're like, okay, we're out here to like make stuff up. Yeah. Right. Okay, we do they it. pretend. Have, yeah. <laughs> set, tell some jokes and then go home. Is that... <laughs> <laughs> do you bump up against like some egos and some personalities, especially if you're brought in later to a process, like later seasons or in a consulting way to like punch stuff up or make it, I don't know, better, more inclusive? Were they ever using you like that? Where they were like, oh, you have a unique personality that these 12 people don't have? I mean, I feel like that's every job. Like, yeah. That's why I'm hired in the first place. Mm-hmm. I mean, my first couple of jobs, I was the only black person. And I was oh, just like, really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, well, okay, cool. Like, this is not my favorite dynamic, but right. I'm here. And it's not like they're saying, Dwayne, say black. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, no, nah, I'm going to just say the shit that I want and that maybe black, maybe gay, and maybe just regular. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I think that like I've never, even though I felt tokenized, I've never like really embodied that because you're just gonna get what you're gonna get. Um, mm-hmm. And then hopefully I, my next job, I wish for the best and be like, ooh, please don't let me mm-hmm. mope people. And that's why I'm I'm always like, I'll give away yeah. advice. I'll help anybody. Like please come. Like that right. is the whole point. Like you can't. I don't want to change things by myself. <laughs> like please, yeah. please. Help me. That's really incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Because a lot of people in your position, I would say, sometimes tend to, like, gatekeep. Like, they feel like, oh, I got here, so it's it's for me, and I'm going to work with the people that are here on my level, instead of, like, trying to bring people up with them. Yes. I think coming up in Chicago and, like, having relationships like 3P, having, like, actual, like, some of my closest people in my life that do this work with me, I think I only got where I am because of them. Like, Saved mm-hmm. by the Bell, I got because of Shantira Jackson, who's on Three Feet. Like, mm-hmm. that was directly. Like, Amber Ruffin, I knew her from Second City. Like, and we we all work very hard because we, we know what we're faced against. Mm-hmm. So I don't see any way, like, how it serves me to gatekeep. Mm-hmm. because what is that going to do? I'm going to enter a space and then be mad because I have no backup mm-hmm. and I have no support. Like, it just, I see the systemic issues and there's just no solution without community in my mind. Absolutely. So that's what I'm going to do because selfishly, <laughs> that's going to make it better for me. <laughs> right. Come on, please. <laughs> I want to be uncomfortable. I want to have as much like fun, like like I said, like my best jobs have just been like easy and fun, mm-hmm. and I feel very grateful to have the jobs that I have. But to have like a really cool job that's like bad, you're just like why? Like 
It doesn't have to be. <laughs> I know a couple of oh. people who have really cool jobs, and then I'm like, how is that? And they're like, so it. stressful. Yeah. And <laughs> like the Always title, to quit. the email signature looks legit as f- but like the actual job sucks. I'm just like, y'all know what this is, right? Y'all know we are. This is make believe. It's all fake. It's oh all pretend God. games that we're playing. It should be do you, fun. Do you like with some of these discussions and you know deadline articles and whatever about different development things? Like, are you excited to be in charge, or do you more like you know adding little bits and pieces here? Like, do you want to be a showrunner? Oh, I'm obsessed with power. Really? I think that's the whole game. Say. It's impact. Got a little warm in power. Here. Yeah, I got hot. Oh, <laughs> say that one more time. Impact. Power. Oof. I like that is the goal. Mm-hmm. Um yeah. I've never I'm good at being a worker, but that's not my instinct. Um I just love it's that again, that delusional confidence. I love my mind. I love the person that I've become. So I'm I've want to be able to make the things that I want in my brain come to life as I've seen others do. Mm -hmm. And the amount of barriers that stop that from happening are annoying. And in order to move them, (laughs) I need power. (laughs) Absolutely. I mean, that's, uh, yeah. I don't often think about barriers in work as annoying, but that's really what they are. I'm like, like, oh, this is frustrating. And how do I solve this? Maybe power. It's like, it's annoying. Yeah, it's just like I just saw that person do it, and they didn't have that. That's annoying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that's it. Um, so what do I gotta do? Yeah, what do I, I gotta, gotta do to make this happen? Get some power. I want to talk a little bit about Chicago. Yes, um, he is from Chicago. Yes, and but whenever real uh, like actual Chicago natives come on, I have to clarify that I'm from Evanston. I love that. Thank you. Yes, because it's a thing. People, Drag people, people, well, you know, it's sort of like people who like uh, are from West Covina, but say they're from LA. Oh yeah, or I'm like I'm from Houston, but I'm actually from like Katy, Katy Texas. Texas. Right. Mm-hmm. So you know, you grew up in a Chicago zip code. Yes. Um, <laughs> But what, like, what about Chicago or growing up in Chicago, like, made you lean towards comedy? Or what did you, like, see when you were younger that you were like, I like that. I want to do jokes and funny things. Um, I think generally, like, performing was just, like, a thing that I really mm-hmm. liked. Mm-hmm. Like, I really like dancing. I would, like, watch music videos and be like, oh, this looks fun. Like, and, like, just copy that. So, like, comedy wasn't, like, really a thing for me until high school and I kind of just like fell into it I was just kind of figuring out like who I was I was just like I played football for like a while and I was like oh, this is aggressive um <laughs> like, oh boy all these barriers I, I was like annoying. truly I said, I said stop chasing me oh my god <laughs> and that was the whole thing because I was a running back they would just give me the oh, ball and damn. I'd be like stop giving me the ball I don't want I don't this want to get tackled. please stop um I don't like this. Uh, so then I quit, and then I joined my my uh, school's dance team because mm. I was like, love dancing. And then, but at that point, I was still in the closet, and I was like, it was truly just me, and then the only other out gay boy in the school. And 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 I said, oh no, they're they're all gonna know. <laughs> so then I quit that as well. Um, oh no, I know. But you know, I would still be dancing at home in the closet. Um, and then my junior year of high school, I uh, I remember it's very like. Grassy vibes. Like I was like walking down the the hall trying to figure out like what am I gonna do next? Like <laughs> who am I? And there's an internal voiceover <laughs> <Truly. playing. laughs> I had on a green sweater, I remember, because I was like gripping the ends, just being like, uh, what am I gonna do next? <laughs> uh, and I heard like a commotion. I was just like, who are these kids making noise? And uh and <laughs> and I went to and like the yes, and it was a bunch of theater kids, and they had just finished casting for like the 10 short comedies there was like that was the fall mm. like play they were doing 10 short comedies and i walk in and i'm like it looks like they're having so much fun like what is this so i talked to the um to the drama teacher and was like how can i be involved in this and she was like well we missed well you just missed it like we just cast it all and i was like oh but, but she was like oh but you can just like be here like hang out like help like do that crew stuff and i was like sure why not this seems fun uh, and then by the end of that process, I was in so many things. I had like my <laughs> own thing. Like people kept like dropping out, and I would just be like, "Oh, I'll do it." 
Oh my and there was, God. like, one scene where I was playing, like, three characters at once, and I was just, like, switching hats. And I was just like, this is so much fun. And everybody around me was like, oh, you're really taking to this. And then, so I did that, and that was, like, my first play. And I was like, this mm-hmm. is so much fun. And then she was the director of the musicals and also the school's improv team. So she was like, come mm-hmm. do that, too. And I was like, all right. Uh, and then I just found out that like, I was, like, really good at it. And then she wow. convinced me. I like to. I have like a stand up joke about it because uh, I said like she like blindsided me, but like like but like the movie because it was like this. She's Sandra Bullock. Joke. Yes, very uh-huh. much. She was like little black boy. You should go do theater. And I was like, what is that? That's real. Mm-hmm. I thought this was just for fun. And she was like, no, you can go to like a, a conservatory. Like you can like do it for real. So I I was like, sure, white woman. Uh, so I auditioned for one school, and I was like, if I get in, then I'll go. Uh, uh, her name, oh, Sarah Miller. I actually just ran in, into her recently. Really? And she, yeah, yeah uh, during the strike because her husband is also a writer. Wow. And wow. we reminisced. And she was like, Look at you now. And I said, Look at you, Sandra Bullock. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yes, she, uh, I auditioned for one school and I got in. So I was like, Oh, I should go do um, theater. So then I went to acting school. And then I got cut from the acting program. Because <gasps> you were too good? I was ex- University. I was explaining Let's this concept to some people who were like, wait, you apply to college, you pay your money to mm-hmm. go to the school, and then they can get rid of you? Yes. yes. They took 48 freshmen, and then by the second year, they have to cut half. Mm. And um, That's one of the more, like cutthroat there's only yes. a few that still do it they yeah, right? they ended Are, it i think like the year after me oh, like, okay. it, it was not great um was a bad business decision you know what i mean if you got all these people yes and it's very funny uh there's this like running joke because um honestly i don't think the school really knew what to do with like queer black men mm-hmm. and that's also one of the reasons i started doing comedy because i was just like this is not fun i'm just like playing like an abusive father in this play that Old angry man in that play, mm-hmm. and me being like, I am so young and fun. Like, yeah. what are we doing? <laughs> um, so, um, wait. What's the running joke? Oh, right. So they basically, so three years in a row, they cut Terrell McCraney, uh-huh. then Jeremy, Jeremy Harris, Harris, and yeah. then me, and we were all like. Well, like, it seems like a pattern. Guys. <laughs> seems like you're cutting the, the lead star talent here. Um, we all went to do our thing, and we were all like, well, look at that. Like, yeah. I, and I do think that that is like the intersection of our identities and also just like being challenged that way so young and being like, oh, you going to cut me? Oh, I'm going to be successful just so you can regret it. Like, how mm-hmm. dare you? Mm-hmm. I'll show you. Um, and I auditioned for NYU that after they cut me, and I got in, and then I couldn't afford to go. So then they I don't do scholarships. Mm, no, it was a lot of money, mm-hmm. and I was like, okay, so I have to do this on my own. And then I saw that Second City was one stop away on the train, and I went to see one of their shows, and I was like, I think I could do this. Mm-hmm. And then that's where I went yeah, there, yeah. and then comedy, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's how it all started. That's amazing. That's incredible. Do you still feel like you still have that drive of like, I got cut, but I'm still better than, well, not better. But. No, I feel like that was just like, at that age, that was like a very like fundamental moment of my like transformation mm-hmm. as I grew up. Right. Um, but that just helped me like recognize similarly, to just like existing in systems and how mm-hmm. y- your perception of yourself versus your perception of how others see you in that space will probably never match. But knowing oh, how yeah. to be aware of what they are seeing so that I can navigate it in a way that's beneficial to me. And that passion for dance hasn't really left you because no. I feel like, I mean, maybe I'm imagining this, but I feel like the last, I mean, I, the last time I saw you do stand up was a while ago. Yeah. Uh, I think up here actually, like in North Hollywood somewhere, but I feel like ha, you, ha, ha. you, you, <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 just a funny name of a place. It was like right after I moved to LA. So maybe, I mean, not there, oh. but up the road. Um, but did you ever like, 
you know, just be like, hit a DJ at the end of your stand-up set or at the start of it and do a little dance? Because I feel like I've seen you dance in between jokes or something. No, I, I used to do solo sketch comedy. Oh, okay. And I used to have a lot of dance in, in there. So I did dance for like a very long time. I did like some like companies. I, like during college, and like I was dancing and doing comedy at the same time. Mm-hmm. And they were just like a lot. So I had to choose at some point. And I was like, well... I can still like incorporate everything I've learned in dance with comedy. Yeah. And then I remember my very last audition, I was just like mentally was also like, I'm not strong enough. Uh, Cause I auditioned for the Paris Opera Ballet. They were doing like a, like a, a sit down. Um, and they like, it started with them being like, hey, everybody take off your shirts. And then oh. they just kind of went down the line and, and was like, no, 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 no. And I was like, yes. This is how this works. But also, oh my God, I I did book it. Um, oh, okay, slide. <laughs> but it's that model. But for the model. people that didn't, I said, oh, what if I wasn't one of them? Yeah. yeah. That's too much. Too uh, much. And then just like kind of knowing, I'm always like seeing like what's the road that's going to like leave me the most happiest. Mm-hmm. And I just knew that like what I would have to commit to dance to be successful at it but just like a little more than I wanted to give, which mm-hmm. is like my body has to look a certain way. I have to like just do a lot more than I just knew, even at that point, that I was like, that's a lot. It's harder on your body. And at the time, comedy, I was just like, oh, I see the pool. I think I could do this. Like, yeah. The bar was a little lower, to be honest. So my mama big fish put me in the pond. And I said, okay, I'm seeing what y'all giving. I can give this. <laughs> I can give this. And, and, a more. and a little bit dancing, more. Dancing, I said, whew, I got to give a lot. <laughs> All of my friends that were dancers have, like, stopped dancing by the age of, like, 32. Well, yeah, They're that's They're like, my body's given out, my knees click. And I, I was like, a, so now for the rest of your life, you're just going to hurt? I had an ACL reconstruction last <gasps> year. Really? From Be- dancing too hard? From my dance class, yeah. And I'm not even doing it professionally no more. I was just in a dance class being like, this is fun. Snap. And then I did, like, a, like a little pivot too quick, and then boom. <sighs> That's my biggest fear. I broke my hip doing drag. What'd you do? Cartwheel on an unsturdy stage. Oh. And it moved and so did I. Mm. Then I fell. And it was to um, Whitney Houston's I Want to Dance with Somebody. Oh. So I was crawling around going, help, <laughs> help. They all thought it was Help me. And they all thought it was a joke. <laughs> And then the song ended and the EMTs came out. <laughs> and they cut me right out of that costume. And they were like, you need to go to the hospital. What was that healing process like? Did, um, did you have to get about like a hip four, replacement? About six months of uh, just like taking opioids and laying around. Nice. To kill the pain. Yeah, it was not fun. Yeah, no, it's you not a good time. You sickening go fund me, though. Oh, yeah, baby. Yeah. Uh, they had to, because well, I was, okay, so, well, I mean, it's not that important, but my insurance <laughs> would not pay for me to see a specific doctor in time. They were like, oh, you can see him in two months. And I was like, but I'm in pain now. So I had to make a GoFundMe to pay to go see a doctor one time. America, it was America, disgusting. this is you. <laughs> Let's take a break. We'll be right back. 